um, Dr. Mustafa, would you like to start now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-mursaleen. Ramadan kareem. Taqabbal Allah al-siyam. Welcome all of you. And a special welcome to our special guest of today, Dr. Hani Al-Banna. As a speaker in Ramadan Summit, as part of the program designed post-COVID humanity, Ta'aruf, Ta'aruf, Ta'awun, Ta'rahum, Aquintas, Cooperation, and Mirceful. It's a program run by Mecca Majlis as an initiative organized by Hamad Ben Khalifa University, uh, uh, Islamic College of Study, College of Islamic Study. This is going to be the final treat of the Design Post COVID Humanity Program. Many thanks and dua for Dr. Mohammed Ivran Tok and his companion and assistant for initiating. I'm following this very important youth program. Uh, youth from all over the world coming together to discuss how the world should be after COVID-19. How can they play a positive role for the implementation of SDGs, which has been struck deadly by COVID-19? Uh, coming back to our session today, uh, it will be as follows. First, I will introduce our guest of today, as he will be given about uh, uh, 15 to 20 minutes to introduce the topic. And then we will give as much as we can, about 20 to 30 minutes for question and answer or comments. And then we will end up by a final remarks from our guest. We will conclude around about four o'clock, three o'clock, I mean. Uh, unfortunately, I might leave after introducing Dr. Hani because of other, other commitment, but Alina will follow that. <clears throat> now, to introduce Dr. Hani Benna, our guest of today, is not something easy. I am not going to say so because, not only because he is a medical doctor from Egypt, or he's a founder of the International Islamic Relief Organization in 1984 in Birmingham City in UK and others, different charity organization which he participated effectively in establishing them not because he has been recognized by several awards for his contribution to the humanitarian work, most notably an order from the British Empire in 2004 for his services to the community, and also uh, the award of uh, Abian II from South Africa and other different awards, you will get it. Not because of his several visits, more than 80 or 85 countries all over the world. Dr. Han el near the orphans, Dr. Han el near in, in, within and in the disastrous space, uh, uh, places. All of this and more, you will get it from the social media about Dr. Han el Dr. Han el for me, is more than this. I know Dr. Han El Banna since 1982 till now, when I was in the UK as postgraduate student during the youth time, when I was uh, uh, the Secretary General of the uh, Muslim Society Organization, Muslim Student Society Organization in the UK, and President of the Federation of uh, 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 Islamic Student Association forces in UK. We participate with Dr. Hani 
and the establishment of the Islamic Relief Organization and other organization. But the most peculiar thing for me about Dr. Han al-Banna is Dr. Han al-Banna, whom I know him in 1982, is the same as Dr. Han al-Banna of today, 2021. I'm not saying this because of Dr. Han al-Banna is in front of me. I am saying this because our program now is addressing the youth. Dr. Han al-Banna is the model of a youth leader. Dr. Han al-Banna is the model of our program of ta'aruf, ta'rahum, and ta'awun. The history of Dr. Han al-Banna should be studied carefully by every youth. Dr. Han al-Banna is a model of a youth leader whom the Ummah is looking for it. Dedicated himself for his work, loyalty to his work. To his work. I am always asking myself, and I raise this question in front of many Islamic charity organizations, why? Our charity organization like Gutter Red Crescent, Gutter Charity, they are participating generously in charity work, but they are not as the international arena, participating in international humanitarian law and, and so on. While we have a model of Islamic relief organization being uh, uh, internationalized. And Dr. Hanil Benna is from the East, he's not from the West. I can describe Dr. Han al-Banna with three things. Humbleness. Humbleness, man tawada'a lillah rafa'ahu Allah. Secondly, braveness. I never seen Dr. Han al-Banna retreat it or go back. He always move forwards. That's why at a very difficult time, during 1999, uh, uh, after uh, 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 the uh, attack in, 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 in New York, the only organization which had been recognized to continue to work in the West and in the East is International Humanitarian Relief Organization. And you can get Hanil Banna everywhere. The places were being forbidden from others. Secondly, I said transfer, uh, uh, humbleness. Secondly, braveness. Thirdly, transparency. He's an open man, open badge. Any money he got it, you donate, you know where this money is going. Dr. Hani is from our world, is from the East is from Egypt, but he never stopped using technology, how to develop charity organization. If I'm going to continue to speak, I will continue to speak till tomorrow in order to show how Dr. Hani is a real model of a youth leader, which we are looking for also. If I, responsible for many institutions, I will use him as Rus leader. Of course, we use Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him as our leader. But that will not stop us in order to find examples today, where today we have very rare examples. I am sure that from the topic which Dr. Hani is going to tackle it today about the journey of life, his book, you are going to learn a lot. My dear youth, please listen carefully and follow what Dr. Hani is saying. This is a pathway. We need you to lead it. You will learn a lot from it. Dr. Hani, without taking you longer, the microphone is yours. Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Mustafa is my teacher, there's no doubt. 
and he's a top diplomat that he opened the doors for me to go to South Sudan when he was a foreign office minister of uh, Sudan and asked me to go to meet with SPLA and SPLM in Nevasha to start our operation in 2003. And with that, he was actually one of the people at the vision for us to work in South Sudan as well as to work any part of the world. Jazakallah, may Allah bless you, uh, Dr. Mustafa, for your uh, mentorship to me uh, since 1982, inshallah. Sudan for me is uh, one of my uh, pieces in my heart, no doubt, because I'm a fish from the Nile, from Uganda, Ethiopia, Egypt, Sudan, Kenya. So all these are in my heart. Alhamdulillah. Salat wa sama Today, I will start with saying, take it easy, young men. Nothing is difficult and nothing is impossible. We started with no budget, no budget, no vision, no office, no big names, nothing. But we started with an idea after the famine uh, struck the Ethiopia at the time, which is Eritrea and Tigray. Uh, we did not know what to do. My visit to Sudan, December 1983, was an uh, eye-opening for me when I met some people from one of the charitable organizations in Khartoum, and they took me by the hand to show me that the, the refugees even are not actually at the border, but they came uh, to Khartoum as well. As we know that Sudan is hosting many, many refugees because they've got different borders with many countries in, in, in East and Central Africa. And from that time, our worry was one thing, what to do? What to do without any resources? So if you come and tell me, brothers and sisters, I have to have A, B, C, D, E, F, yes, no, start. Start if you believe. If you believe in what you're going to do, you have to start on a very simple uh, platform. Start initiative. Don't stop trying. Don't stop failing. Because failure is a part of the story of success and achievement. Nobody will achieve anything or become a successful man or woman without failing. I failed many times in all my exams. I never got my exam right from the first time in the whole of my life. That's why simplicity, not complexity, is what you need to look for. Actually, if I would like to start to with warning you of four red cards, if you are playing football and you kick somebody or you punch somebody or you thump somebody, like uh, Zidane did it in the World Cup against the, one of the defenders in the Italian team, and you got the red card and you were thrown out. My four red cards are as follows. My four red cards are as follows. First one, the respect your father and your mother and your family. The respect, the absolute unquestionable respect and love and care for your father and your mother and your family. This is the first red card for me if anyone does not do it. Because those two people are the, the key and the platform and the gate for heaven as well. It's number one, the first red card. The second red card is your history. Our history. I'm just shouting at the history because many of us do not know our history. Many of us do not know the value of the contribution of our nation to humanity. The value of contribution of our scientists to humanity, scholars to humanity. Don't know it are being very much distracted by media, by others. The people who do not know the history of their nation will never be able to, re to realize the current status of the country and the surrounding, and they will never be able to create a very successful future for their community, their society, and their country. 
history is the foundation of success for building, for stabilizing the uh, society at the present time, then building and go ahead for building a very successful future. This is the second red card of not knowing your history. And if anyone tells you, forget about history, you have to suspect his or her intention because their history might be dubious and bad history. But your history is excellent. You have civilization from uh, Istanbul, you have civilization from Baghdad, you have civilization from uh, Damascus, you have civilization from uh, Andalusia as a whole, and all your history is building greater civilization since, the, since Islam came, that engaged everybody in the local community and the extended community. community. This is number two. Number three, to be very arrogant in this, the Arabic language, we have to seek as much as we can to learn the Arabic language. Most of the scholars in Islam were originally non-Arab. But I remember their mothers, may Allah bless their souls, were actually forcing them to memorize the book of Allah, then forcing them to learn Arabic language. Even if I remember the mother of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, his mother used, and he was, a, he was an orphan, and she was a very poor woman. She used to wake him up before Fajr and take him to the mosque and force him to pray Fajr there inside the mosque and wait for him to take him back to his house. This is the role of the mother, which I mentioned in the first red card. So the first red card is the parents. The second red card is the history. The third red card is actually the Arabic language. Why am I saying Arabic language? The Arabic language is far more ahead, far more ahead in any other language on earth. Challenge me if you want, and I accept the challenge and be sure that you'll be defeated because of the proverbs, because of the metaphor, because of all this. Well, Arabic language will have 12.2 million, and the second best to them is the English language, which have got a mix of Latin and Roman, actually have 600,000. From 12 million into 600,000. And we worship other languages. And the Arabic language widened the scope of thinking and the philosophy of thinking of the individual because of its metaphor and its proverbs. The fourth one, sometimes young people like yourself and myself think that they know a lot. They start to give fatwa. And they said, we are men, and they were men. No. Like, نحن رجال وهم رجال. No. If you look at the story of how people used to learn the knowledge, they travel on foot from China, from Central Asia, to Baghdad, to Damascus, to Cairo, to Kufa, from Andalusia as well, coming on foot for years and years and years and years. And most of the great scholars were learning for tens of years before they started to give fatwa. And for, because of their humility, they never called themselves scholars. So these four red cards young men and young women is for me and for you to keep remembering and to actually to to control our arrogance and to improve our relationship with our family and to learn our history and to take the initiatives and to learn the language the language which is really a master a masterpiece not because i'm born in cairo i'm very lucky to speak arabic even dr mustafa uh, very, 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 very lucky to be born in Sudan to speak uh, Arabic language. But at least, at least, you see, if you look about Ibn Majah, Al, Al Bukhari, a Muslim, and other, all of them are not from Cairo, are not from Gadda, are not from Riyadh, are not from Damascus. They are from Central Asian Republic. These are my four red cards. First of all, because when I, when, I, when I sit down with you, I have to make that challenge. Because I know that your people are very powerful, energetic, dynamic, and here we go. Before you punch me, I thump you and I punch you. So stand up for me and come back on it. Otherwise, I give you the knockout and you're out. And I went like Cassius Clay, he declared his Islam as Muhammad Ali, the great. This is. Uh, 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 how I start. 
I said simplicity, taking as much initiative as you can. What do I mean by initiatives? Do any small project on a local level, even on a street level, but have this kind of project which have the quick impact result to let the community surrounding you believe in what you do. If you have an idea, if you have an idea, don't sleep. Think about it. Keep thinking. Think because idea should be structured. Idea should not be a flat layer. It should be a complex, complicated, structured a composition that you have. You keep thinking about different sides, different aspects, different dimension, different horizons of this little idea. If it's going to be fighting poverty, if it's going to be clean water supply, if it's going to be education for children, if it's going to be a protection for women, if it's going to be protection of displaced and homeless people and refugees, if it's going to be uh, a technical work and, 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 and. This idea has to be made like a structure. Then you get the closest people to you to let them to believe in your idea. Then you start implement your idea on a very local ground where it becomes successful and encourage your colleagues as well as encourage the community surrounding you to change it from a small initiative to a project, then from the project to organization and so you can grow. My last uh, point for me and you, because we're all young people, is don't trust things. Don't trust things. Never trust things. My son, when he was born, born after nine months, nine months at least to be born. Then for my son or my daughter to go to school, it will be about four to five years. That's, that's, five, that's about nearly five, six years. So my son or my daughter will be qualified from the university, it will be another 15 or 20 years. So this process of educating one individual takes about 20, 25 years. So don't trash, particularly in the time of uh, conflicts, the time of revolution, time of social change. Young people all the time want to change everything yesterday. Doesn't work. Otherwise, why the Prophet ﷺ stayed in Mecca for 23 years, for 13 years? To build a solid individual a solid ground for the second phase to come. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So don't trash, be patient, show perseverance, and be committed and believe, believe, believe in what you are going to do and what you want to deliver for the public. I think I'll stop uh, now because uh, I leave the platform for you to ask any difficult question uh, any, uh, any, uh, sorry, I ask any stupid question and I ask you also to become stupid like me and ask any stupid question as well. So my other boss coming now, Alina, actually, and she is taking the leadership from our mentor, Dr. Mustafa Osman. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, Alina, please go on. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So my name is Alina. And thank you so much, firstly, Dr. Hani, um, for this incredible, inspirational talk. And um, referring back to your four red flag, flag points, firstly, about um, respecting the parents. Um, I agree that if we, like for any person to succeed, if a person does not respect their parents or does not have family values, then you cannot get, go anywhere with your life. You cannot do anything. So that needs to be embedded in a person. And secondly, about the, uh, the knowing the family history, as we were just discussing, I personally have so many questions about my family history, about you know, how it started and who's in it. And another idea a friend of mine gave me, which uh, I would suggest everyone maybe to work on or implement is to have a family history book and like include pictures and anecdotes and like ask stories and questions from your grandparents or your uh, like grand grandparents if you have uncles aunts any anything and just form a family history book together 
And uh, thirdly, about the Arabic language point, um, yes, I think we all, and especially because it's Ramadan, we all, the more we know the Arabic language, the more it's easier to understand Quran and uh, implement it as well, inshallah. And lastly, talking about the initiatives, um, this um, Ramadan summit is an example of it as well. And it's providing an opportunity, a platform for the youth. I mean, for those who are not giving a talk, you can always uh, attend the talks, you can ask questions and you can make the most of it. So thank you very much for this. And for me, I've known Dr. Hani Albanna since 2019, when he first came to the Maker Majlis event, our first ever event at Hamad bin Khalifa University. And it was because of his direction and support that I start, I did my iLab project for my master's in Islam and global affairs with Islamic Relief Pakistan. And it was to do with women empowerment and how they're using vocational training skills program to empower them so they have a sustainable livelihood. So if it weren't for Dr. Hani Albanna, I wouldn't have done that project. And through that, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be where I am today working on developing a startup which will provide artisans in selling their handmade products to the international market. So I have a lot of respect for you and you're my role model. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khair. And now I will open the floor for any questions. So if anyone has any questions, please. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tegan, uh, you, you can unmute yourself. No. Sorry, I'm just having... Um, hello, Dr. Hani. Hello. Uh, yeah, this is Tekan, and I'm sure if you look at the background, you can see 2019 in Istanbul, where Humanitarian Action Forum, I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Having you, seeing you again um, on this virtual platform, thanks to um, the Ramadan Summit. I'm happy again after, um, I think, two or three years. I, I'm very happy, honestly. Um, you, you made mention about the issue of knowing your history, that's family history, community history, and equality history of the state. Where, where I come from, we are caught up with this kind of historical dilemma in the sense that uh, a lot of history, which concerns probably this English speaking part of Cameroon, former British Southern Cameroon, were hidden from us. And why do I say we're hidden? We know about the French side, the French history, about the French speaking side of Cameroon, but they don't know about our own history. Where you go to textbooks, they don't say anything about us. Uh, and those who wrote about the history of former British Southern Cameroon, their books are not anywhere to be found. In fact, a lot of them were arrested before we even know, got to know about this. I'm sure you are aware about the ongoing conflict. It's only because of this conflict that we got to know about a lot about the history of former British Southern Cameroon, which up to date, a lot of the French speaking people don't accept. How, how do we get to reconcile this? Uh, a few days ago, uh, the government set up a commission of, I think, 26 people to rewrite the history of the country. And mostly the French speakers on their news channels deny the existence, the historical existence of former British Southern Cameroons. And one time, a French parliamentarian said, we should forget about the history of Southern Cameroons. So how do we reconcile this as human beings living on, on Earth? We've got Muslims and Christians living in that country, particularly from the English-speaking side. How do we reconcile this? Uh, I think you have to, to go to the very old traditional way of history writing by asking the elderly. I had a talk about uh, how to write history. History to, to be right in parallel. Yani if we have a country of 26 uh, governorates, 25 governorates, and if we want to write the history of the country, we have to ask the people in the 25 government to write from each government the history that they have observed or the history that they have been known. Unfortunately, most of the history now written is written by the political power who might be manipulated by foreign power. In your case, we know who is the foreign power. Yeah, and in West Africa, we know who is the foreign power. Actually, all these West African country young men and young women are extremely rich. If we can talk about Chad, if we can talk about Central African Republic, or Central, the Central Republic of Africa, which is CAR, 
extremely rich, but controlled by one or two countries and the multinational companies who are actually taking the wealth of Africa to different countries, particularly, particularly, particularly for my advocacy, Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah. Since the 60s, they prevented it from becoming independent and they divided it in Kinshasa and Brazzaville. Brazzaville. Yeah, both of them. Huge country, extremely wealthy. Don't talk about uh, Saudi Arabia or the Gulf countries collectively to see the wealth of the, 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 the United, actually, uh, country of uh, uh, Congo and the Congolese suffering during the Portuguese, well, not Portuguese, not Portuguese, the Belgium, Belgium. Belgium, the Belgium occupation, but they were called the people with no hands. Yes, yes. They're, little, they're not very energetic to cut, I think, the rubber and whatever it is. And for the king, I'm not sure his name is uh, Leo, Leopold, King Leopold. 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 And they, the, the, the punishment is to cut the hand of those individuals who are not. Uh, there and I think the Congo itself lost about 10 million people during the occupation of the Belgium. And when it became successful to start at the time of uh, Patrice Lumumba, and they brought to Shambi actually yeah. to fight him and actually to kill him, and then divided uh, Congo into parts. This is a part of the history that's not actually uh, uh, studied by any students, but you can get it from the elderly. Now we are at the time we have to to to, to grab. You know what you mean, grab? Yeah, Not only yeah. to collect, because the, to grab the history from the mouth of the elderly who are living in different parts of uh, of Cameroon, different parts of Chad. Yeah, yeah you know, in Chad, and you know, in Central African Republic, there's something called Anti Balaka. Nobody talks about it. Anti Balaka is a terrorist organization, making the ethnic cleansing of the Muslims from from Central African Republic. When I was ha having a high level meeting with a lot of humanitarian in one of the top humanitarian meeting, I said, what are you doing about anti-Balaka? Do you know it's existed? Yes, we know, but you don't publicize it. It's up to me and you or to the people of Central African Republic to publicize such atrocity being done by the uh, anti-Balaka. The Lord's army, which was in the north of Uganda, and what has done to the people of Uganda and to the people of South as well. So when we look at it, unless we have those individuals will be able to grab the information, to collect the information and to put the information to change them into documentation and books and encyclopedia, we'll never be able to know our history, unfortunately. Teach your history to your sons and daughters. I cannot hear you. Can you unmute him, Sister uh, Alina? Okay, I, I want to ask you my a stupid question, Prof. <laughs> 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 what do you cook best? <laughs> what I cook? Yeah, what do you cook best in the kitchen? <laughs> uh, when I married my wife, uh, she was from a middle class family. May Allah bless the soul of her father and mother. And I used to get the lamb leg, you know, lamb leg. Yeah, yeah, sure. And to put, and it cut it, it's more, put some holes inside of it. Yeah. And mar marinate it. Oh. With uh, onion, with uh, black pepper, with uh, salt, and leave it overnight. Oh. And they used to make kofta with the same thing. Okay. And, and she used to invite her, her, uh, her uh, what do you call it? her uh, friends friends and to praise her she said no no she used to tell them it's not me it is him uh -oh. <laughs> because because i was i was bachelor for five years in uk before she came to uk in 1983. okay nice so nice, nice, nice. of the lamb legs the shoulders and all this sort of things okay thanks very much dr honey nice again meeting you you know no hope to meet you again probably in istanbul or somewhere else child on child we'll yeah, do yeah, yeah 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 sure Thank you, Alina. Thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you so much. And now we have another question from Bayan, um, who's also one of the organizers for uh, Maker Majlis. 
So she says, my niece refuses to speak Arabic uh, and she's only three years old, even though they try to talk to her in Arabic so she can learn. So do you recommend they try to get to her to like speaking Arabic instead of English? Uh, I'm not saying don't speak English because I'm not going to be against other languages, but I'm going to uh, ask her to be encouraged by getting lollipops, uh, some sweet, uh, some token of appreciation, uh, huggy buggy, uh, all these kind of things which actually get the, the young uh, girls to be, uh, or the young uh, children to be uh, in love with the language itself. And unfortunately, if the Arabic speaking individual in the family are a little bit hard and harsh with her, she will never speak the language. If they are very kind, actually, she will actually speak the language. But actually, at this age, you encourage her by uh, giving her more love, giving more gifts and other things. And uh, the, other, the, th the second thing is not many much uh, uh, drama uh, uh, on this age, uh, at this age for the children. Unfortunately, most of it are actually in English. And the people who are doing this kind of stories and uh, plays and drama for the children do not know the age differences. When you come here, and I know that there's books bet be between the age of uh, six months and three years. So just see the images, to under tell them to understand how the images look like. Then they go from seeing the images to the sound, from the sound to the action, and so on, so on, so on. For us, unfortunately, because we are not professional enough in making this drama or this storytelling, is just one size fits all, which is not good, unfortunately. But actually, it depends on who is with the young girl at home to show her the love and not to force her to speak Arabic, but let her to love to speak Arabic. Okay, um, thank you. Um, anyone else? Would anyone else like to ask a question? Okay. Uh, okay, I'll just ask the question and then I'll give it to you, okay? okay. So, Dr. Hani, I have a question. So, the fourth um, red flag, which you were talking about how we should um, come up with initiatives. So during my um, journey, when I was working on raising funds for this, uh, for the startup, this is what I experienced. And we, this was the first time where I was involved in raising funds through a crowd uh, funding platform. And I shared it amongst my friends, colleagues, everyone, but there were certain people not talking about people within my support network, but other people who are more, more of like acquaintances, they raise this, they're like um, your father or your brother or the kind of family you come from or the kind of status you have. Why are you not um, seeking support from them? And why are, you choosing, why are you choosing this way to raise funds for your, um, yeah, for your initiative? And at that time, like, you know, I, me and my friend, we were quite demotivated because there as a, as a, as a young individual, I would, I prefer doing things myself. I want to be independent. I wouldn't want to be like, okay, you know, it's like keeping it as a last option of taking help from the family. And then, so they were like, if you have a safe uh, spot where you can just, you know, get financial support from your family, then why would you take this difficult step? And and I was like at that time. So how how do uh, I? Ask, what's the best way to answer people with this? I think he said thank you. Uh, the floor is open for anybody to give money. It's not a family business. It's not a private family foundation. It's a public initiative. My family contributed. Jazakumullah khair but it's not enough because I cannot depend on only one family and I cannot deprive any other family from contribution because giving money is a blessing to the family. So I should not actually be having monopoly only to my old family and actually 
keeping people away from it. It is a, actually a kind of a spiritual connection between the donor as well as the uh, recipient. Let me tell you something in my last talk about how to divide the cat money. Because there are some certain young people said the cat should be adamantly spent in the local country where the donor is spending his zakat or her zakat, which for me is wrong. Nothing is called 100% zakat is spent in one country. It has to be divided between the donor's country as well as the more, more, much more poorer country. And when I came to poor countries like Cameroon, for instance, like uh, Central African Republic, for instance, like Bangladesh, actually, like uh, Syria and Yemen at the moment. So even if the donor from this country, he or she should not spend 100% of the donation in Yemen, on Yemen, in Cameroon. You know why? I want them to spend 90% in Cameroon, in Chad, in Niger, and 10% in Somalia. Tell me, are you stupid? Like brother uh, uh, Tikang was telling me, are you stupid? I said, no, I'm not stupid. I know what I'm talking about. Because when the money comes from Niger to Chad or from Niger to Somalia, the people of Somalia would say, oh my God, God bless them. They are as poor as we are. But here we are laying the foundation of the concept of Ithar. Ethar, Ethar, where the poor man or the poor woman will be able to contribute to somebody who is poorer in spite of the fact that they need the money and they need the thing. So when these individuals come and talk to you about that, tell them it is an open platform for people to share the blessing. And it's not forcing you to donate. If you don't want to donate, there's no problem. Many people will donate. But it's an open platform for blessing sharing, blessing, uh, sorry, blessing sharing, yeah, uh, and, 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 and care sharing as well. So those kind of people don't want to give you the money. That's why they put this kind of dubious question to you. Yes, please. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Hani. I will keep this in mind in the future. Um, now, can we um, give the floor mic to Fatin? Fatin would like to ask a question. Yeah, I think this uh, Bayan has said you know, she would. Uh, oh. She would be. It's okay. A, it's okay. I already asked a question. We'll we'll have you ask a question this time. I'll go next. <laughs> or <Okay>. after. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Hani. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah. Uh, Dr. Hani, as I'm active volunteer, um, maybe we. When I start like volunteering locally, I'm so fine. But when I start like being part of UN agencies, uh, an active volunteer, um, you know, when it comes to countries, they are not Muslim. I know it's kind of a humanitarian field. There is no differentiating between like uh, Muslims and not Muslims. But you know, sometimes they are asking me to provide such kind of um, volunteering tasks for countries or group of people who are not Muslim. So in this field, yani ana, yani I, I, I used to provide my, uh, my uh, volunteering and my tasks and my, uh, but I'm kind of inside like feeling, uh, is it right or is it wrong? Especially when we are talking about like um, Indian countries, um, these countries who are not Muslim, you know, you got me? So what is the role of, oh, yes, I mean, I mean, is it like being in a humanitarian field, mainly I'm targeting the humanitarian refugees all over, all over the world, on the globe. Um, I used to go to Ersal, I used to go to Bangladesh. Okay, I'm fine with all these countries. But what about when it comes to non-Muslim countries? I think you have to look at it and from different aspects. Aspect number one, do they need your help or not? Because when the help is needed, you have to respond to it. Like in uh, Haiti earthquake, mm -hmm. actually, we were not thinking that the Muslim charities globally will respond. But at least we found that 22 or 25 organizations from UK, Muslim charities responded there. Even Islamic mm -hmm. Bank of, of the OIC donated $6 million to Islamic Leaf to build schools for the Haitian, actually, after they've been destroyed. 
So do they need help or not? That's why, and I was in a, was another group this morning, said, in your shopping list to go and help, look at the most forgotten and needy community to give. Because might be another community which is needy, but many people are giving them. Mm -hmm. But those people are not uh, given. So this number one, if it's needed, yes, go. Second point, when you go to work with different culture, you will, def they will learn a different uh, manners, a different attitude, different etiquettes when dealing to be careful of stepping on their foot and their tool because they might have different culture to your culture. This is a challenge for you. When you go mm -hmm. to work, uh, to, to, to volunteer in, in uh, with Yemeni or with Syrian, the same culture, there's no, mm -hmm. no challenges. So, yeah. but actually, if you go like in India, with all the backgrounds of what's happening to India, especially in Kashmir, this is to, 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 to let you to grow up or to rise in your uh, philosophical thinking of how can you uh, deliver the aid or the training to people who are in need in spite of the fact that the state mm -hmm. is not actually uh, uh, sometimes in, in, cert in certain countries, in certain countries, in certain countries are not actually fair to different minorities. Mm -hmm. You have to take it as for educational process. The third and uh, one is uh, you will uh, you will connect with other organizations with different experiences. Mm -hmm. Like the Indian do it differently to the Pakistani, the Pakistani do it different to the Bengali, the Bengali do it different actually to the Nepali, and so on, so on, so on. And this is strengthening your, uh, uh, your character. The last and not least, to be extremely good on your CV, that you are impartial, neutral, and you can go and help anyone and everyone. And this is the part of the humanitarian, of the humanitarian mm -hmm. response actually in Islam, is go to help anyone if they need the help from you. So I can get a, a few response that you are with, you are for, you are I with am, the, I am, I am, your I am, community. I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Fatin, for your question. And now we will take our last question for today, which will be from um, Bayan. So Bayan, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Alina. <laughs> That's my second question today. Um, I'll try to be quick so that we don't take everyone over time. But uh, yeah, I'm the one who asked about my niece. So the thing is, uh, it's understandable why my niece talks like that. Uh, talks in English mostly. It's because all of us were went to uh, English schools. You know, I went to a British school, and so did all of my siblings. And you know, after that, we studied uh, after school in Canada. So, so our main, our first language is English. Our stronger language is English. Um, but with our parents, of course, we talk in Arabic. And to this day, like between each other, my siblings and I talk in English and my parents get really annoyed. My dad always at the dinner table, he goes like, mom, can't you speak <laughs> So that's the thing. And, and, and he always says the biggest regret I have is sending you to English schools because your Arabic is terrible. Um, and now like when, uh, like a lot of the times, uh, even Dr. Everton, he knows he's my boss. He, he, he always sends me to, to do the interviews for all our programs because they need Arabic speakers. And I'm the only one who speaks Arabic in the team, <laughs> but I always get ang anxious. I have a nervous breakdown just because it's in Arabic. Um, so I guess my question is sometimes it feels like it's too late. I know that that's not true, but it feels like it's too late for me to learn Arabic the way that someone who went to an, an Arabic school knows Arabic to feel as comfortable with Arabic the, the way that they do. Um, so what what's your recommendation for for people like me who are, who are brought up in English schools their whole life and and they speak any Arabic, but like they can't like write as as um, articulately as uh, as someone who who's an who went to an Arabic school their whole life. Uh, it depends on you, Sister Bayan. What do you want to do with the language? If you're having a job in China and they force you to speak a Mandarin language, you will do speak it because this is a job. It's a breadwinning, it's earning your salary. If you have a job in Germany or a degree in Germany, 
The first requirement from the German government would give you one year course of German language to master the language, German language because maybe all the education would be in German. The same for Turkey and the same for English and same for other. It depends on you, Sister Ben. Nobody will be able to tell you what to do. Do you want, and actually this is number one. Number two, if you want actually to learn the language, to understand the discussion or the communication, this is one level. If you want to learn the language, to read and write is another level. If you want the language to enable you to be an author and analyst, this is a different level. So it depends what level you want to learn the language for. I'm not saying actually, trying to criticize you, but what I'm saying, it is entirely up to the individual. Now I know a Pakistani brother, actually he was trying to his best to speak Arabic, actually when he was actually volunteering with us. He married a, a Yemeni uh, sister, and he is very close to the Arabs than anyone else in the whole community because he, in his intention, wanted to master the Arabic language. But he, 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 was, he was a bus driver, and he's a bus driver. Yani his education is not as top as you are, people. But actually, he is trying to have this extra mile to learn Arabic language because he would love to learn it. And it's up to you, Sister Bams, up to you, Sister Alina, up to you, Brother Tikang. It actually is how much you want to go forward. And if you want, if you if you manage to put your first footstep at the right direction, at the right direction, not just first uh, footstep to the backward direction or to the wrong direction. No, first footstep at the right direction, you will be able to reach where you want to be. Thank you so much for this, Dr. Hani. And now we will take our last question for today. Um, uh, Tekeng, um, would you like to unmute yourself, please? OK. Um, Dr. Hani, I'm back again. And I'm a Christian, but since I moved to Turkey in 2018, most of my friends speak Arabic from Syria, from Yemen, from Sudan. And that moment where I'm in their midst and I want to speak with them. So I told them that I need to take special classes after school. But COVID-19 came and a lot of stuff happened. But I think I had to probably go back to try to learn Arabic. It's very important for me as an international relations student. And I think it's going to probably add to probably the fifth language, which I definitely know. Um, doctor, this is, this is my question. There's this issue about simplicity, which you mentioned in your, in your discourse. Some people say that being very simple it's a fault. How do we get to reconcile this? That if you're very simple, your enemies can attack you because of your simplicity. How do we balance this? Simplicity does not mean stupidity. Okay. Simplicity means when you start something, if you not, now, if you want, like Sister Ben is talking about the Arabic language. Yeah. When you sit down with a child, make it simple for them. Make it easy for them actually, to make it attractive for them to know the language. Simplicity in the, in the initiative means it's, it's not a co very complicated initiative. If you are talking about Cameron, how many, how many problems is facing Cameron? Maybe hundreds or yeah, thousands. Yeah, a lot, a lot. And, how, uh, and how, many, how much is the complexity of this problem? So you start with a simple problem at the, not, not, not on a city level, even not on a village level. But maybe on a street level, this is simple. When you when you get your five or six brothers and sisters, whether they are Christian or Muslims or others, actually sit down together. Let us actually plant half an acre. You need to plant maybe five thousand acres. But if you say from the very beginning, I need to plant five thousand acres, ten thousand, nobody will come with you. But half an acre, oh yes, they managed to get uh, cucumber. They managed to get aubergines. They managed to. And once the people see the fruit of this project, they will go and your idea will become very complicated afterwards. Actually, being simple, actually, you know how to deal with them. You learn how to tackle them, how to respond to them, how to protect the community. As well as being simple, 
in a way of not difficult to let the people, your people, not to follow on you. Because if your if your if your communication with your people become very complicated, high level speeches, very eloquent speeches, most of the audience actually from the countryside, from the farming and whatever it is, what this man is talking about? You don't understand what he's talking about. Make it simple for for them. Actually, like you say, you no. Know, if you talk about Jesus, peace be upon him, alayhi salam, he used to walk in the slums. Is that right? Yeah. To teach the people and invite people from the slums. Yeah, definitely. What what language? What 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 level of language he will use? Peace be upon him. When to, when talking to the people living in the slums. Uh, oh my God! Parables. With, with what? He uses no, simple, the not, simplest. Not just, the simplest parables, parables, but Simpl very simple languages. Uh, not Shakespearean language. Yes, yes, yes. Not Shakespearean or Chosa. So simplicity means that you understand the level of the intellectual level of the people you are dealing with. Yeah. Thanks very much. Doctor. Thank you. And give my salam to Jesus, please. Yeah, please <laughs> I will, I will, I will. You know, I love Jesus. I know. I hope that you love Jesus as much as I love him. I am challenging you now. Yeah. I love that you love Mary, our lady. <laughs> Mary, peace be upon her. Yeah. As, I, as I love her, I love her very much. I adore her. Not okay. just love her. The Lady Mary, the only Lady Mary. Yeah. Peace be upon her. And actually, she's an icon for humanity, as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi taught us. Lady Mary is an icon for humanity and one of the four top and greatest women that humanity uh, observed. Lady Mary is one of the top. You got yes, it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Give, I got it. I got it. Give got my it. salam to them. Otherwise, I'll sort you out when I come to Turkey or I come to Cameroon. <laughs> I will. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that, doctor. Thanks very much. And thanks to Dr. Talk for, for this. You know, it's only here that we can get such a program. It's only here that we can get such personalities. And thanks, Zaman, um, Alina. This was great. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Now we're running short on time. Um, so we will wrap up. Thank you so much, Dr. Hani. And um, we will keep the four red flag points in mind about respecting parents, about our family history, knowing our family history and knowing, learning uh, about the Arabic language and lastly, to take initiatives. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Family history and the uh, Ummah history. Yes. Family and history and the Ummah history. Yes, and the Ummah history. It was an honor having you with Sorry, us. before you uh, conclude, sorry to interrupt, but maybe um, I, I think maybe some other people have questions for Dr. Hani. So uh, if they're interested to ask, if there's a way to get in, in contact with Dr. Hani, maybe he can uh, put his social media information or his email in the chat so that people can can ask him uh, after the, the conference if they need to. <laughs> Inshallah. Even if they want my tell my, my my WhatsApp number, most welcome Alina to give them the telephone. <laughs> okay. I'll yeah, I'll share his contact details in the chat box below. Thank you so much, Dr. Honey. And tomorrow our session will be at 2 p.m., but the day after that it will be at 5 p.m. So stay tuned and stay on board for the Ramadan summit. Jazakallah.